Hi, this is my video on critical thinking with Stefan Molyneux and Peter Joseph. I am neither. I just watched their video online and I find it very frustrating. So I'm going to play parts of it and then I'm going to give some commentary on errors in critical thinking and ways people are trying to be manipulative towards the working of the capitalism. And I did leave the time code in from the original video. If you wanted to see where these clips are coming from, that should be easy to find. So I'm going to start by jumping into this point around 41 minutes into the original video. This thing called the non-aggression principle, and what frustrates me again is that everything you speak of I agree with within the principles that you advocate. See, I don't agree with the that the idea of the market, that as you as you conceive of it, is is just that a system of voluntary exchange with non-coercion, and people just follow this basic ethical guideline that everything's going to be fine. I look at it from its root source and course of human evolution, and, and using history as a guide. I look at the root psychology of what it means to have this concept that's preva pre prevailing in society, where you're supposed to be put on a pedestal for gaining while others suffer. This psychology and value system disorder is ever pervasive, and it really does define the state. And I can't deny. Well, okay, but uh, sorry, I'm I'm waiting for you to take a breath, but I feel I'm going to wait in vain, so uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a sec. So this idea sure. that in a free market you gain while other people suffer uh, is is foundationally incorrect. I mean, as as the Austrians would say, it's praxeologically incorrect. Right. Uh, so, and I know you know this, but just for the for the listeners, of course. Um, fundamentally, if you and I exchange something and there's no coercion involved, I don't have a gun to your ribs, I don't have your children hostage or anything like that. If you and I exchange something voluntarily, by definition, we are both better off because of that exchange, right? So the old example is if I have a dollar and you have a pencil and we voluntarily exchange those two items, then by definition, in praxeologically, in reality, foundationally, rationally, empirically, I must want the pencil more than I want my dollar, and you must want my dollar more than you want your pencil, because we're freely exchanging those things. So in a free market exchange, two, the two parties who voluntarily exchange are by definition better off. Uh, they have, and, and this is true if I decide to go and work for someone rather than start my own company, uh, I choose that as a better course for myself. Um, Here we have Stefan trying to make the point that the free market system is based upon voluntary trade. And he's doing something that's very manipulative. He's taking a very reductionistic example and showing, well, this reductionistic example is voluntary. Therefore, the entire system is voluntary. Uh, this is ridiculous. We have to go over what reductionism is to understand what he's doing. Reductionism is the idea that if you take a complex system and break it down to its itsy bitsy parts, you can understand the entire system by just looking at uh, one of these little parts. So he says that this voluntary exchange is the entire system. This is it's completely ridiculous. Now, it's true within the narrow context he's talking about, again, people do have their voluntary choice. However, it's not voluntary if you wish to engage in the free market or not. That's not. You are coerced by the system to engage in the market. Or, or else what else? You can go live in the gutter and starve. You know, and he takes things very literally. So Stefan, because yes, you do have the free choice to go live in the street and starve to death. That means that it's your voluntary choice if you wish to participate in the free market or not. That's the way he thinks. And this is absolutely ridiculous. When you have the working class and an ownership class, the working class is coerced into selling their time for money in order to buy stuff produced by the means of production. The entire system is based upon coercion. So it's not a voluntary system. There are aspects of the system that are voluntary, but as a whole, you know, it's not. Uh, if I choose to go and start my own company, I've both worked for people and started my own company. It's just a matter of personal choice. As long as there's no force involved, as long as there's no fraud involved, unlike your unfortunate experience with the video production company, by definition, both parties are better off because they have both chosen uh, voluntarily to 
perform that particular exchange. Uh -huh. And so there's no way to get around that. That's just a basic okay. fact. Now, and if and you I'm use the government to, to, to print money and give it to you before the inflation hits the poor, which is wretched in the foundation, unfortunately, of our economy, if you use the military industrial complex, you know, most of the jobs that have been created since the financial crash of 2007 have been in the military industrial complex. It's completely... Now, Peter Joseph's reply, and then especially the reply that Stefan gives, is very interesting in, in what Stefan, uh, how he responds to this. Now, Peter Joseph just is going to call out Stefan for doing what he did. And he just ab basically abstracted away the entire edifice of free market capitalism until all you're left with is two people exchanging two commodities. You know, why these two people have the commodities? Why is there scarcity? Why is there restriction? Why are they doing this? How is the, how, how are these goods produced? What's going on with resources? What, what's going on with reference to technological context? All of that stuff on just abstracted away until he's just left with this exchange that seems to be happening in a vacuum. And then now Peter Joseph is going to call him out on it and look at how Stefan responds. Evil. Uh, and this is the mass murder. But I mean, what on earth is the mass murder? As I sort of go back to this okay. point, what does this have to do I with the free market? I understand. Once again, you, you blockade, and this is the concept of truncated frames of reference that I was in the midst of, I'm still in the midst of describing. And we can talk about voluntarism in a second. In, uh, in pure vacuum and in the void of space, uh, these theories hold true. In other words, you can have perfect circles when there's nothing else drawing influence. The fact of the matter is we live in a, a constant continuum of pressures. Uh, let's, let's jump into voluntarism, if you don't mind. And I don't use the same simplistic view as you do, and then this will explain why. So voluntarism- I would really appreciate it if you would stop calling my view truncated and simplistic. So after truncating away everything that happens on the free market capitalism, except, except this voluntary trade, he then says, don't call my ideas truncated or simplistic. If you do that, it's an ad hominem attack. That's basically what he's doing. But his ideas are truncated. His ideas are simplistic. He did truncate it off all of free market capitalism until he was left with so little that it proves absolutely nothing. Then he claims that his idea is not simplistic when he has not even begun to analyze anything to do with capitalism. He just abstracted the whole thing away until he's left with this little isolated island of exchange separated from the physical world. If I mean, you those... prove that my view is truncated and simplistic, you don't need the damn adjectives. Well, if you I'm... don't prove it, then it's just bullshit uh, ad hominem, I've right? Already... So just refrain from the, if I can ask for that intellectual respect, refrain from constantly insulting my position. I don't believe I've constantly insulted yours. Okay, no, I'm not trying to insult yours, and I'm sorry you interpreted that. When I say truncated, I'm Oh, so not... simplistic That's... and truncated are, are terms I... of respect. I... So after now abstracting away all of capitalism into this very reductionist, simplistic model, he's now making the argument that you cannot call what he did simplistic or truncated or, or whatever adjective anyone wants to use. And you know something? The, the response that Peter Joseph gave is the same basic response I gave, which is the same basic response that anyone who was critical of free market capitalism would, would give, which is that you have to look at the entire system to understand what's going on. You can't just isolate one little exchange without reference to anything and understand what's going on. And that, that is simplistic or reductionistic or looking at things in a vacuum or whatever adjective. So what Stefan is trying to do is he's trying to say you can't call it simplistic or whatever because that's attacking me personally so so he just equated actually discussing what he did and analyzing what what he says he with an ad hominem attack in other words he's trying to set up rules of debate where you cannot discuss his ideas I see. No, simplistic and truncated are qualifiable distinctions that I'm using in the associations prove that it, I'm creating. Prove it. Don't say it. Well, I am. Just prove it. I am. Prove, prove it. Don't say it. That's well, all I'm saying. Well, you can keep stopping me from speaking by acknowledging that, or I can keep going. Is that? Can I? Can I talk? No, no. I'm just. I'm just asking you to lay off the ad hominem. I'm not. The first is this distorted implication of free will, as though any action we manifest exists in a vacuum, absent the ever-pervasive conscious and subconscious social and psychological pressures we endure on a daily basis. Humans have a limited capacity to control their own behavior. It's a fact. We exist in a continuum of social influences that are invariably subject to the behavioral propensities and reactions of the culture we inhabit. 
That said, as a broad overarching consideration, the second more specific issue is that there is a clear and present fallacy that engagement at all in the market system is voluntary, as though we are all just equal in our reductionist existence as voluntary exchangers. This just might be the most absurd concept of all when it comes to this type of worldview. The market system's structural imposition for survival itself, in my view, unnecessarily given the state of technology and our capacity to create an abundance, coerces all human beings to submit to labor for income and to engage in the act of trade whether they like it or not. It's not voluntary, and believe me, if it was voluntary, I would be fucking gone. I'd be on the hippie planet where people actually share ideas and resources and not act like spoiled children fighting over everything. So in the core root principle of voluntarism, it's thrown right out the window because the system is intrinsically coercive, okay? And that's a powerful point because when you begin to look at the stress of our society, when I we, but, without, but sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, I, I'm not following what you're saying. Okay. How is voluntary trade coercive? That just seems to me like saying lovemaking is rape. It just seems like you're just jamming two opposite things together and because, calling them the same. Because the act of trade itself is coercive. I'm not saying that the. And how is the act of trade coercive? Because people have to trade in this system to survive unnecessarily. They have to do something. They don't have to trade. They have to do. Well, how to, do they have to trade? They have to either trade. They can their go. Labor, they can go and and I mean, ninety-eight percent of the world's surface is uninhabited. They can go and live in oh. the woods and they can grow their own food. Oh. Here, here we have more manipulation. This whole that's like saying love making is rape. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. Like when he's challenged with something you can't answer, he'll just say that's like saying love making is rape. We're, like he's the one who's not qualifying it. He's the one who's looking at one side of a system and he refuses to actually look at the entire system so when he says that's like saying love making is rape in effect what he really means to say is there's a complex system but I refuse to even acknowledge that there's a system I'm only going to look at it from one side I absolutely refuse to acknowledge that there's any other perspective I refuse to acknowledge anything is complex I refuse to acknowledge that there's anything beyond reductionism therefore I'm just going to say that's like saying love making is rape and that's basically what he's doing because he's trying to he's trying to sound intellectual he's trying to act like he's a philosopher, he, but in re, in actuality, he's an anti-intellectual because his repeated message over and over again is that you cannot analyze the system. If you try to have multiple perspectives on what capitalism is, on what economics is, on what economic coercion is, on what system, systemic violence is within the system. If you try to do any of those things, you can't intellectualize any of it. That's like saying lovemaking is rape. Don't go there. Stay with this simple reductionistic example. Therefore, Stefan Molyneux really is an anti-intellectual. And then when he's really backed into a corner with this issue that you are coerced to participate in the free markets, then he says, oh, you can go live out in the woods by yourself. Why not just say, oh, you can go live in the gutter until you starve to death? And, you know, literally that is true. No one is totally coerced to participate in the free market. You can go live out in the street, starve to death, freeze to death, you know, wh whatever. You know, who, who, you don't need any context to anything. All you need is the actual literal truth. As long as it is literally possible to just say, I voluntarily refuse to participate in the free market, as long as there's any literal truth to that whatsoever, then you can just bullshit your way out of it because who cares about looking at anything within context? That's and they true. can hunt their own animals. I don't understand how it is they have to trade. Uh, that, that's a wonderful point, and I think that's hilarious. I think it's great to look at a global <laughs> economic system and decide that it's voluntary for people not to have to engage in the market system. That's hilarious. I, if I could do that, I would Sorry, be Sorry, but of saying money. that's hilarious is not actually a rebuttal. Oh, no, I mean, people don't right. have to trade. I you think that the point right. that I'm making is it's to their advantage to trade. Oh. I think people find that the division of labor, like I fish and you grow wheat and we, we trade or whatever, the division of labor and all of that is economically productive, that people specialize in doing things and then trade the results of that labor so we don't all have to become good at everything. I think people find it advantageous to trade, but saying how that somehow forces them to trade, uh, I think is not clear to me. I've, I've watched 
the vast majority of my friends who got out of college exist in occupations and in institutions to get money that were nothing in respect to what their talents were. It had nothing to do with them. They despised it. I've watched people commit suicide. Not watched them. I had a friend commit suicide because he couldn't get a job after so many periods, such a period of time. He had no sustenance. His entire sense of self-worth was so demeaned. These types of things don't have to exist. But, See, but I, we, we both agree that what we're talking about now is not the free market. So when I, I talk know. about the free market and you start saying, well, I know people in this environment, we I do don't not. understand what that has to do with what we're talking about. We do not both agree that this is not the free market. I am stating that the fundamental principles that underlie the free market, the absolute core of every single school of thought of, of market capitalism, if you will, is intrinsically inherent is in, has an intrinsic inherent quality that gravitates to all the propensities that I'm speaking of this is the free market whatever happens is no real. no sorry and again I have to be pretty technical here if not just back downright rational okay. uh, the free market is voluntary exchange uh, and the state is the initiation of force That's these two are opposites That's... exactly it's like saying that that love making is rape or theft is charity no. you're just mingling these two concepts okay. together the free market specifically repudiates the actions of the state, which is the initiation of force against usually legally disarmed citizens. So if you say, well, our current system is the free market, despite the fact that it's dominated by the state, which doesn't conform to any of the principles of the free market, uh, I think is missing the point. No, I, that's, your, that's your definition and your assessment of principles. I'm actually looking at the real world. I'm looking at the fact that, as I said earlier in the initial principles of fallacy, that the state is in fact an outgrowth, an arm of the power and differential advantage in gaming theory needs of of the market itself. It is there just as anything else. There are people behind the scenes in government that make an enormous amount of money in the context of market economics, in the context of trade, in the context of everything that you speak of, but they use the arm of the state to their advantage for their elitist purposes. Do I think that's right? Absolutely not. I would love, Stefan, to see the type of market that you talk about. The problem is it's impossible. There will always be a gravitation towards these power consolidations. Some of them may work for a little while, some of them may falter, but there will always be that propensity. And when I say the free oh, market... Oh, but, but Peter, come on. Just saying that something is, poss is impossible doesn't make it so. You sound like somebody in the 16th century who's saying, well, we've always had slavery. Slavery has always been part of human society. Slavery has always been a part of trade, and therefore we're always going to have slavery. Now, I, I agree with you. It's terrible that the slave trade is still uh, occurring, but generally in the West, uh, we've kind of got away with direct slavery. Now we have kind of indirect slavery slavery through taxation, but that direct owning and buying and selling of human beings has been largely bypassed. So saying something is impossible and will never be and so on, I mean, for okay. a guy who's kind of a futurist, it sure. seems to me that's, that's kind of a leap. Well, I would say that it's just as impossible as the fact that the law of gravity, uh, I can't decide to just step on this wall over here. There are fundamental psychological principles that are inherent to the marxian of the so-called no, no, state. No, no, I know what you regardless. think. I'm just saying don't misquote me okay. about what I said. Well, I, I didn't say it's inherent in market capitalism. I said it's inherent where there is a government. Well, I kind of would have to say that within the argument, within the recognition that this propensity is there, assuming that there's an inevitable fallibility to every entrepreneur, that if they see a state, they're going to run and use it to their advantage, the very core value disorder inherent in their interest to do that to basically want coercion, which basically implies that every single entrepreneur in some fundamental theory is interested in gaining whatever type of advantage it can, it's, it creates a, a non-argument. Uh, the, the very problem that I want to get rid of with the economy is this, this very propensity. Wait, sorry, did you just refer to what I said as a non-argument? Is that your argument? I just described how it was a non-argument to the extent that if you have the incentive I don't think system, you did, actually. I, I don't think you did well, say you keep, it was a non-argument. Well, if you keep interrupting me, then I won't be able to. I'm repeating what I'm just saying. I thought you were moving on to another topic. No, Sorry, I'm go repeating ahead. what I'm said since you missed it the first time. If you have the incentive structure built into the entrepreneurship, the intention of maintaining def differential advantage, not worrying about the interest of others, because that's an inherent element of all elements of market psychology, and you're going to say that that element is fine as it exists, as long as there isn't a state, I completely disagree, because they're going to the, the tendency of that is going to persist regardless. The tendency to want to create power monopoly consolidation will exist regardless, and it will happen. <laughs> and you can't say that there's the, f the free market will just stop it because its mechanisms are so strong and, and all these supposed fail-safes. The only fail-safes that can stop there are the legal system. The legal system is the state. This, it's, it's... 
So what's basically going on here is that Stefan got caught and he acknowledged that if businesses do have a means of using coercion to gain differential advantage, yeah, then they will go outside of his free market ethics and they'll do whatever they can for that differential advantage. That tendency is there, not that it will happen at every single time. And so what does he do when he's really nailed with this? Well, instead of really answering for it, instead of um, acknowledging, yes, there is this tendency in the free market and it is inherent, he, he just bypasses the entire question. And guess what he does? He uses extreme reductionism. And using extreme reductionism, he comes up with some fact that is irrelevant to the main core argument, and then he just attempts to divert that entire conversation in a different direction. And let's see him do it. Okay, well, uh, first of all, I think we're back to the beginning where you said that they're not worrying about the interests of others. Uh, if you're a business owner, I guess you've never been a business owner, but if you're a business owner, a you business. actually have a lot of people's interests that you need to worry about. You oh, need yeah. to worry about your shareholders, your board, your employees, your customers, a lot of people's interests that you need to worry about. Uh, purely selfish people uh, you know, in a free market generally don't tend to do very well because it's win-lose. And the only way that businesses become sustainable in the long run in a free market is if it's win-win for the customers and for you. So this idea that you, if you're in business, you don't worry about the interests of others is just we have him doing the same thing over and over again. He reduces a complex system down to just one isolated fact, abstracts away everything else, or pretends that that fact it, you know, means something. So yes, businesses are motivated to take care of their customers in order to keep them. In what way does that perspective contradict the fact that businesses are also motivated to do whatever they can to gain differential advantage over other businesses? What does one have to do with the other? Now, instead of even attempting to answer the, the, the problem that businesses are motivated to do whatever they can for differential advantage and using the state is just one example of businesses doing that. He doesn't even attempt to answer for that. He just comes up with an, another argument that's just extremely reductionistic. And, and the only thing you can say about this argument is it can only make sense unless you're somehow incapable of looking at the entire system. Uh, yes, within this free market system, there's going to be things that work and there's going to be things that don't work. You can't just take um, one thing that from one perspective seems to work and say this is the entire system. That, that is illegitimate. Uh, and therefore we don't have to worry about these other things that don't work because we show that one thing does did work. That, that, this makes no sense. Either want to have an objective view of the entire system of free market capitalism, or you want to nitpick little factoids, uh, abstract away everything else that, that contradicts your viewpoint, and pretend you're an intellectual. I might have a I might have a uh, freelancer that needs X amount per hour to get what they need done. I might be well aware that they are $100,000 in debt because of a bill or a college debt. I might be aware of all the needs that they that they require in order to try to get themselves out of the the state of impending coercion, as I would call it, that exists where they are just vulnerable to any type of social manipulation because they can't make ends meet. They would have to go. They could be at 7-Eleven. They do all these things that they don't want to do because of what this system does. I can be very aware of that. But if I don't personally have the means to provide for those needs, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's a matter of business acumen. Really good business acumen is not a moral decision. It is a decision of what can actually work. And the, the sickness of the whole profit price mechanism concept, the sickness of this idea that we just navigate everything within the slow confine, within the narrow confines of price and profit on the assumption that, oh, if you're going to be profitable, then you must be efficient. Of course, you have no idea what's creating that efficiency. It's a complete decoupling of nature. It's a complete decoupling from our understanding or our facilitation of public health. None of it's built in. And that jumped ahead, actually, to a point I wanted to make a little bit later. But to answer your question, I am well aware and I wish I could do a lot more when I when I deal with people that are I'm so you, but for. you you do worry about the you you do worry about the interests of others. You may not be able to alleviate all their oh, problems, so I, but hey, you do you do care about yes. the interests of others as a business owner. And that right? brings that brings a great point. Everyone means well. I'm not saying that people in this system just corrupt themselves. Everyone means well. What about sociopaths? I don't think sociopaths mean well and they're like 4% of the population. They probably think they mean well. That's a that's 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 an amusing point, but the point well, okay. is, is that then it's, an un, it's a non-falsifiable proposition. So let's sure. move on. It's when it comes down to the fact that people engage this system and they believe in it, they navigate in a, with a very narrow blinder on in a very simplistic way with respect to how they maintain their own survival. 
this is this is the underlying marketization, the market ethic that runs through. And as a natural structural consequence, you invariably have to forego the interests of others for self-interest. I think that there's nothing that you could disagree with on that one. That's just the way it is. It doesn't mean their intentions are wrong. I, I don't believe so. I, 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 self-interest as a business owner is in, in in is completely wrapped up in the satisfaction of customers, of stockholders, of of uh, employees. Uh, if you have employees that you like working with who hate you, they'll quit, and you will be then exposed to the cost of of hiring and retraining other people. So, if you annoy, irritate, or, so or, believe... or anger your customers, they will stop doing business with you, and you will be out of a job. So, uh, if you uh, don't provide decent return for your shareholders while keeping all of those other things in consideration, then you are going to be uh, out of a job. If you anger the board, they can get you kicked off as a CEO. So, uh, yet you absolutely tangibly have to worry about the the interests and and happiness of other people uh, in free trade uh, if you can't get someone to want to do business with you then you're kind of in trouble yes absolutely I'm not saying that that is a false statement but going back to my my example with respect to the experience I had the owners of this company did not mean bad this was a generate a, a system pressure generation that happens naturally throughout the system because it's again predicated on scarcity that's not to, not enough to go around everyone is struggling for this profit efficiency and it, there will be winners and losers there will be market correction there will be market discipline and my point is that discipline and all of its structural violence and all of its permutations is inherently inhumane and unnecessary now since okay so let me let, so you're saying that that market discipline and market discipline is if you can't assemble your scarce resources, including your life and maybe your savings or whatever, if you can't assemble your scarce resources in a way that sufficiently satisfies the needs of others uh, and turns a profit, that that somehow disciplines. Within this conversation, a big point that Peter Joseph is trying to demonstrate is structural violence. That is that violence does not come from an individual attacking someone else, but there is violence um, built into the structure of free market. Now, this is something that Stefan Molyneux cannot understand because he has to take things literally, and he can only understand violence if, literally speaking, someone is initiating violent force against someone else. So, for example, following Stefan's train of thought, and I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but it seems to be that in his world, if someone has a job somehow, and due to market correction, they lose that job, and because they lose that job, they have no money, and because they have no money, they are unable to buy food, or they are unable to purchase a medication that they need to survive, and they die, then that's not structural violence, because literally speaking, no one is actually killing the person. That seems to be um, his basic th um, thought process. Now, he doesn't believe in systems. He doesn't believe that there are networks. So, like a big argument he'll make like on his website is things like, he'll say that there's no such thing as a forest. There's only isolated trees. And likewise, there's no such thing as society. There's only individuals. That's kind of like saying... There's no such thing as the internet. There's only isolated computers. Of course, there is something as such as society, as society is the network of humans interacting with each other. And when you have humans interacting with each other, you get a network, and the network is more than the sum of its parts. And we see this across the board with multiple networks and so forth. But So because he has this view, he doesn't seem to be able to understand structural violence, he can only understand direct literal violence. Uh, and now he's being forced with um, answering structural violence. And, you know, how is he going to answer for this? Well, he's going to do what he does with everything. He's going to take some irrelevant to the main argument reductionist example, say that the perspective of this reductionist example is, will somehow disprove all of structural violence, even though he, it's obviously not by his example. So let's watch him do this. So if my daughter sets up a lemonade stand and she can't get people to buy her lemonade, that she's being subjected to some sort of violence? I'm saying that given in a world that we can create an abundance where there's a technical reality to solve numerous problems on one side, a technical state of efficiency that is so abundant and so obvious, we are restricting ourselves in a massive way by 
persisting with this system that's based intrinsically on scarcity and the dynamics that incorporate failure. So again, okay, listen, structural man, you, violence. You gotta, you gotta not. You got to not just uh, do this uh, filibustering stuff. This kind of a yes/no right. thing. So you talk about uh, uh, market uh, corrections or market discipline being a form of uh, what did you call it? Uh, structural violence. It has the propensity. And so, of creating... if, uh, if my daughter sets up a lemonade stand and people don't, they drive past. Maybe it's not that warm. Maybe they just don't feel like lemonade. If nobody buys her lemonade, is she being subjected to structural violence? That's a yes/no question. No, Please don't not. filibuster me because I can't follow what you're saying. No. It so he just did two things there. Um, number one, Stefan briefly just dismissed this whole issue of technolog technology and reference to it. You know, if whatever economic system is in, we have really needs to make sense within the context of available resources and available technology. In other words, the a rational economic system that might make sense for Stone Age humans is not necessarily going to be the same economic system that makes sense for 21st century humans. And Peter Joseph was making the point that given our current state of technology, we don't need this game. But that was a minor point. The major thing that Stefan is doing is he's taking the entire entirety of structural violence built into capitalism, but specifically the structural violence done against individuals when they're working for a company that fails, and he's saying all that is irrelevant because in the isolated case of his daughter running a lemonade stand, which, you know, that she will not be subjugated to structural violence if that lemonade stand fails. So he's saying that any business goes under all the employees working for it, all the loss of livelihood, all that, none of that is structural violence because of his daughter and her lemonade stand. You know, you know, this is just stupid. You know, Stefan Molyneux is not an intellectual. He's not a philosopher. He's not a thinker. He's not an economist. I have no idea how anyone can listen to such reductionistic nonsense and take this seriously. This guy is just a fucking idiot. Nothing he says makes sense. If you go through this entire interview, on absolutely no point does he actually address anything Peter Joseph says. He answers nothing. Every single, everything Peter Joseph says, Stefan Molyneux just takes some um, reductionistic fact that kind of maybe seems relevant, takes an extremely narrow perspective, and, dis and just dismisses everything else. So uh, this is an extreme example. Under the narrow perspective of his daughter's lemonade stand, she's not subject to structural violence. Therefore, one can just abstract away the entirety of structural violence as if it does not exist. And you call this a thinker? You call this an economist? You call this an intellectual? Who are these people listening to Stefan Molyneux? Because we have all these people and they think this guy's brilliant. He's not brilliant. He is just repeating verbatim libertarian talking points that have been going on for 50 or 100 years. And he's using reductionistic examples that somehow exist in a vacuum, devoid from um, anything related to reality. You just can't abstract away reality and then say, I'm right because in my little vacuum world, this one example seems to make sense. How is that philosophy? How is that critical thinking? How is that trying to understand the world? I mean, it, it's not. It's stupid. It's fucking stupid. And why do people listen to this guy? I mean, do you look at learn about networks, learn about systems theory? He he is you know when you actually look at the video, he's there's a confused look on his face whenever Peter Joseph brings up anything that requires a a network or a systems analysis. It's like he can't do it. It's like he can only come up with these narrow-minded reductionistic examples and his thought process never leaves it and he just bullshits of whatever reductionistic example is going to serve his world view. Uh, and there's only so many times you can repeat this. I only showed like, you know, maybe a quarter to a third of the video, but that's the entire video. That, that's his entire economic philosophy is to abstract away from the entire edifice of capitalism and use dinky reductionistic examples as, as if, you know, there's no world. And then when he's challenged on it, he calls it an ad hominem attack. And it's incredibly repetitive, and I feel like this video is repetitive. I keep on saying the same thing because he keeps on doing 
doing the same thing. Okay, that's it. Bye.